Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. created a lifestyle apparel brand rooted in the fishing world with his brother here locally in Oregon. He is a father, husband, musician, and outdoorsman. Please welcome the co-founder of Steelhead, Alex Hejon. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with Alex Hejon, and I'm excited, Still HD, because me and Alex, we've connected before. But before we get into all of that, Alex, how are we doing, boss? I'm doing good, man. I'm doing. Uh, you made the the classic mistake there already with the with the name. It, it's just Steelhead. Oh, it's just Steelhead, not Steel <laughs> yeah. HD. No, it's just Steelhead. But you Steelhead. know, it's kind of funny because the way it's written. So that's yeah. a great point yeah. for the folks at home. The way yeah. it's written is S T L H D, and it stands for yeah. Steelhead. Yeah, you just take take the vowels out of the word Steelhead. I love it. There you go. So Alex, let's introduce the world. Who is Alex? So um, my name is Alex Hudjohn. Um, I am the youngest of four kids, and uh, I have done many, many things in my life, my adult life, um, as far as jobs and and things like that. And um, somehow I ended up making um, outdoor lifestyle apparel for people who like to fish. Now, why, why fishing? What, what, what got you into fishing? Um, so I've always, I've always been a fisherman since I can remember being a little, little boy. And my grandfather really was, it was like his number one hobby love. He liked to hunt, but fishing was, was it. He, they, they lived in San Diego. He was, um, Korean war, world war II you know, lifetime Navy guy. And he loved fishing. And I don't have a lot of memories of him because I was really young when he passed away. And I didn't get to see him very often. But one of the things that I do remember of him is that when he did visit, we would go fishing. Um, And when he passed away, I sort of inherited all of his fishing gear because I was the one who was into it. And so trying to uh, give you the 30,000 foot view here. So I spent a lot of time, probably a decade of my life in bands, playing music, touring, doing that type of stuff. And at the time when things like, uh, like Photoshop and um, the the ability to record digitally and all this stuff, it all, all that power kind of came back to the artist in a certain, in a, to a certain extent. And so you, in that very much punk rock ethos, I was, I was one of those guys who was doing the artwork, doing the album covers and the t-shirts and printing them in the basement and all that stuff started to become accessible, right? You didn't need the big machine to do it. Well, I got into making t-shirts and doing all the artwork. And then I was a graphic design major for a while at Portland state. And um, my design professor told me that I had no talent and I was never going to do anything with it. And then um, as I got more into fishing as an adult, I realized all my friends that were into it were old, you know, band guys or guys that rode BMX or skateboarded and their knees were bad. And so they needed something that they could do outside and it was active, but, um, they didn't want to give up their sense of style. And every time we'd go in, I'd walk into a bait and tackle shop or a fly shop, you know, with earrings and tattoos, at the, you know, and that type of stuff. And, it would you would get basically shunned and i just thought this is this is lame you know um and my brother and i wanted to start a business together he's since moved on but when we started the business the whole idea was to um create something that gave that that made it more accessible and we just we started doing it right at the time that instagram really became a thing and it allowed us to really grow by leaps and bounds 
learn a lot along the way. And that's where the world of everything I learned about like t-shirts and stuff and design sort of ran head on into fishing. And I just thought, well, this is kind of cool. Let's start a business, you know? And, and, and so we started doing it and here we are. Now, did you kind of start the business out of the same concept as your band, just printing out of the basement and selling them on Instagram, or did you kind of grow, you know, fast? No, we, we actually started initially focused in on specifically fly fishing. I loved fly fishing. I did, I, I fished conventional gear and fly fishing, but I, I thought it was like, it just seemed like a lot of the people that I knew that were fishing were gravitating more towards fly fishing. So we bought a URL called DIYflykit.com. The guy I was working for at the time told me that the, the term DIY was searched more than the term porn. So, oh, so <laughs> yeah, so we bought DIYflykit.com. We were selling these, these do it yourself fly tying kits. I'd buy them from sports warehouse, peel the label off, put my label on them, include a t-shirt and a koozie. And that's all we were selling. We were trying to sell them and we sold a couple. And the idea was, well, maybe we'll make enough money for gas to go fishing. Right. Well, turns out everybody just wanted the shirt. They didn't want the kit. And so I started making more shirts because they were easier to get and make and you could do it on demand. That was the thing is it didn't cost anything. We figured out if I filled my garage with screens, only did two color screens and we burned them in a certain way to where when it didn't take a lot of time to register them, that we could put four or five screen printing presses in that garage, leave everything up. The ink doesn't go bad. It's plastic ink. And then Every night I'd get the orders, one, two a day, maybe, and I'd print them, ship them out the next day on my lunch break. And we just started doing that and until I was staying up till midnight every night. And then um, I bought a house. I sold my house in Forest Grove, bought a house in a little town called Dilly, just outside of Forest Grove that was on an acre. And I say a house. But it was pretty much a tar paper shack with <laughs> a 40 by 60 pole barn in the back. And I bought it for the pole barn and we moved the business in there. And my brother and I both had sales jobs working on the phones. And so I'd be on the phones with clients, selling them stuff, printing at the same time, <laughs> and shipping orders. Love it. And we, and we did that for a couple of years until we were both able to go full time and make next to nothing, but we were able to go full time. And that was, those are the days when you get paid and you got, you know, you pay all your bills, you go through your budget and you're like, okay, we got $75 for the next two weeks. Don't go anywhere or do anything, you know? Um, and we did that for many years. And, um, and then he ended up, deciding he wanted to go do something else. And he moved to Southern California and sold a portion of his business to my now business partner, our then employee, Adam McNamara. And so now me and Adam own, own the thing. Nice. At what, what point was, what was the catalyst for you? Like the turning point? Cause you mentioned, you know, you guys got to this point where you're working through it. You're starting to go till midnight. You get in the barn. At what point were you guys finally like, you know what? it's time to go full-time on this. I, I can't do the sales job anymore. Yeah. Um, honestly, we, we waited too long. We should have done it sooner in retrospect. Um, I feel a little bit bad in that I, I should have quit the job I had before I didn't, I was stealing time from them. And I've, I've apologized for that um, to the person I was working uh, with or for at the time. And um, and I'm not, I, I, to this day, don't feel good about that, but it really just came down to being able to see we're we're seeing pre consistent enough numbers to where it makes sense. This is the dollar amount that I have to make to survive. And it seems as though our accountant said that I could make that amount every month. Some month would be, some months would be better than others, but you know, that's, that's just, it's really just the simple math of it. And it wasn't even the demand of it because, um, that to me, I've always sort of prided myself on being like, 
Look, I'm not the smartest person in the room by any stretch of the imagination. And I don't have the money either. But I'll outwork almost everybody. And so I had a newborn baby that was, she grew up on the front of me while I was screen printing shirts. And I mean, I would, I would get there at dark, leave at dark, ship everything, do everything, taught myself how to do every aspect of that business. And so it wasn't like the workload part of it. It was really just the dollars and cents. Yeah, we can do this now, you know? You know, you mentioned the finance piece. Um, is this is this kind of a grassroots built business or is there, is there any financial backing outside of not lending like loans, but I'm talking like venture capitalists or is this no, primarily none, grassroots? None, none whatsoever. It, it really, uh, in fact, I was working for a screen printing supply company doing sales at the time we started this business. And they bought a screen printing press company. And I, my job at the time was to sort of head up the acquisition of that from a, from a physical standpoint. And when we went up to the warehouse, there was just these, I mean, two 30 yard dumpsters full of screen printing parts, like screen printing press parts and screens and all kinds of stuff. And so I said, Hey, if you're just going to throw that away, I think I'll just load it in the back of my truck and take it home with me. And so we Frankenstein a bunch of stuff <laughs> and it cost us next to nothing. My brother had his own screen, real small at home screen printing equipment from a previous <laughs> thing that he had done a couple boxes of t-shirts. And then I had saved, I didn't, we didn't have kids at the time and I had saved up some money. My wife was working and um, we just here and there would invest 500 bucks, thousand bucks you know, whatever it was into it. And um, up until the point where we we didn't really use credit cards until we were like a fully functioning business. And then it just got to the point where um, we were able to like negotiate terms with suppliers and things like that. And it just sort of or organically grew. Nobody's ever invested any money into this business. Nobody. Um, we've borrowed money for sure. You, once you get to a certain point where you, you go to a bank and you say, Hey, I want to borrow X amount of dollars, but, um, nobody has said, Hey, I want to invest in your business and help you grow. It was all, and, and I own it a hundred percent of this business is privately owned. Um, a friend of mine, John owns a little tiny piece just cause we wanted him to be involved. And then Adam owns his 15% and I own the rest. Oh. Now, have you ever felt a moment, you know, obviously you and your brother kind of started this out. Now you and Adam, have you ever felt a moment, a moment of like self doubt? Oh, absolutely. A hundred percent. Um, not enough to quit, but, <laughs> but I have a hundred percent felt that, um, I think I, I definitely think the start of the pandemic was, was probably the biggest one. So we didn't know what we were going to do. Nobody knew what they were going to do. And we didn't know how to approach it either. I'd like to say that like we were one of these people who are like, you know, I don't care what the government says or what the the governor says or whoever that this is, we're going to do this. And that's how we're going to do. We didn't have any idea. We were just trying to survive. And luckily we made a couple good decisions during that time. Um, but you also have to remember right at the start of the pandemic was when my brother was selling his portion of the business and the people who were going to buy it backed out. Oh, we had to pivot fast and figure out how we were going to get that deal done because he had already, you know, the wheels were in motion for him to move and he was done. He was just like, look, I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. Um, and it was just time to be done in that regard. And then um, so we're having to navigate all of this via email and phone and figure out how we're going to advertise. And just, it was absolutely, it was chaos, you know, all of our dealers, cause we have a wholesale component, all of our dealers closed up shop cause they had to. Right. Yep. And so we just did a quick pivot calculation and we're like, 
well, I guess if we're not selling at reduced margin to wholesale, then we can invest more into advertising and drop our free shipping threshold down and just try to push direct to consumer as hard as we can and do some interesting things. And it worked. Um, but the beginning of it was like, that was a go home, have a couple drinks, <laughs> sit down with the wife and go, so have you ever thought about working at McDonald's? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it was, it was rough. And my wife had just started nursing school too. So it was just like this trifecta of how the hell are we going to do this? Um, and she was pregnant. <laughs> the quadruple whammy right there. Yeah, honestly, as these words are coming out of my mouth, I'm like, I hadn't how, really thought about that. Well, that was how the hell did I actually do all this shit? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Man. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, but here we are. And we've recently made some decisions, business moves, put ourselves in a position to be able to be more scalable than we were. Um, and now is the time where that dust has settled because those were major moves that dust has settled. And now we can start to go, okay, how do we, how do we do this? How do we take it to that next level? Um, because it's honestly, beyond time we're probably a year beyond when we should have made those moves but the pandemic sort of forced our hand with that what what works your vision for you know still hitting the next five years where how do you plan to scale you know we were just were having this conversation before i hopped on this podcast it's we opened our retail store in tualatin and i i think Anybody that's in any kind of e-commerce business knows that e-commerce is not going anywhere, but that after the pandemic, there's a lot of people who are like, man, I want to go to a store. And the idea of experience retail has always intrigued me. I'm a huge fan of the business of Disney. I'm not like a huge Disney fan. Like I don't have a Mickey Mouse tattoo or anything, but I'm a huge <laughs> fan of Walt and the idea of and and Michael Eisner and Bob Iger and the the people who have run that business and moved it in the directions that it that is gone and and the idea of experience retail really intrigues me and so that's what we tried to do with this store and you know if you're going to have a store that is nothing but steelhead gear apparel there's no tackle there's no rods reels and whatever how do you make it an experience it can't just be t-shirts on the wall because if that's all you're doing you're 100 percent wasting your time so you have to do weird stuff which is art in and of itself which is basically at the core of everything that we do is creating an artistic environment for an outdoor activity right um and how do we turn this store into our stage how do we make this the tillamook cheese factory of steelhead gear right so we have a cold room where we, you come and you want to try on jackets and hoodies. It's 49 degrees in there year round. So you can try on jackets and hoodies in the cold room. We've got a bait cooler that has little bait boxes and it's 40 degrees. And it had, but inside that cooler, inside those little bait boxes in the cooler is just little sticker packs. So just like you would at a bait and tackle shop to get like a thing, a sand shrimp or something, you open it up and it's cold and you get it and it's just stickers. Cause it's an experience. Yeah. We have nets that hold koozies and keychains. We have dead animals and stuff on the wall, you know, that type of thing. And we wanted to cross between that cross between a, a skate shop and a tackle shop. And we've got, you know, just all the things that you, you would come to expect from like, from a true experience of a brand. Um, I love what Disney does with scent and smell. So we have uh, an industrial diffuser in here that smells like rain when you come in, you know, just that type of stuff. Because again, 
we're not the cheapest t-shirt and hoodie or hat that you're going to buy. And we know that. But what you're buying is the quality, the lifetime warranty, and the experience that happens every time you walk in this door or put that hoodie and t-shirt on, how it makes you feel. Do you feel like you're part of something? And if you don't, then I'm not doing my job. Man, I, I hope listeners right now, I hope you guys are taking notes because I think that was probably the most insightful way to explain the opening of a store from an apparel perspective. The customer experience is key. You know, I'm thinking about Nike. I'm thinking about Disney. I'm thinking about all these things. It's it's not the way that it looks, but it also it's like, how does it make you feel, right? How yeah. does that brand make yeah. you feel as a person? Now, Alex, is this your first business? Mm-hmm. Yeah. How, where yeah. did you get all this insight? You mentioned you did creative design, but now you're, you're scaling a business and you're really kind of getting, how important was it to like get out and network and meet with other people to kind of learn what you do now? Um, I've always been sort of an outgoing guy and, and, and I've always been a student of people who, uh, intrigue me. And I'm, I always, when I was a little kid, I used to my dad would buy me like, you know, a little RC car and I would just take it apart because I want to know how it worked. So everywhere I've worked, I've always sort of like peeks behind the curtain whenever I had an opportunity to see how it worked. Right. Um, and not only with, with businesses, but also with people. And there are a number of people in my life who have sort of mentored me along the way. Um, and I'm also a firm believer in um, if you want to be, you know, the old saying, if you want to be rich, do what the rich people do. If you want to be skinny, do what the skinny people do. So if you want to do a certain thing, find some, what, what that is to say, if you want to do a certain thing, find somebody who's doing it and, and see how they did it. And then just apply it to whatever it is you're going to do. My dad always told me, the only difference between you and the guy you're going to pay to come fix your sink is that he already knows how to fix your sink. Get a book, figure it out. And I, I've always, that's one of the most impactful like things that my dad has ever said to me. Um, and it, it's really just, you know, I, I listen to a lot of audiobooks. Um, I, made a lot of mistakes, <laughs> a lot of mistakes, <laughs> a lot of expensive mistakes. Um, and I've also kind of always done, I've done a lot of things. If, if I, if I'm, I just did this on my last birthday, I was talking to my wife and she's like, so you just turned 42 done a lot of shit in 42 years <laughs> and i didn't really think about it but i'm like wow I'm 42 years old i've lived in 33 houses in my life jesus I'm, yeah oh man yeah, i moved a lot i've had number of jobs i've never been fired from one but i've had a lot of jobs different kinds of jobs i was in a band for years toured put out records i was a college football player that took me to England to play football. I mean, I've done all kinds of different things that just have allowed me to become this weirdly rounded person, you know, that is not a master of anything, but I know a little bit about a lot. And in this business, that really helps. You know, one of the things you mentioned is you've, you've traveled, right? You went to England, you've gone, you've gotten a lot of different experiences from a lot of different cultures because you've been quite a different places. How yeah. important has that experience been to really creating you as the entrepreneur to be able to visualize, okay, this is what the customer wants? Well, it's huge. Um, you know, the one of the jobs I had was I worked for a, a company that makes landfill equipment. So I've been to almost every single state in the United States, at least somewhere, and traveled a lot of that by myself. Plus, then you've got the touring aspect of being in a band where you fly over, drive everywhere and and do that. So you meet a lot of different people. I grew up in a place in Northern California that is very conservative, very hunting, fishing, rednecky kind of place. That's a part of who I am. I can't ever get that out of me. I also spent 12 years in Northeast Portland playing basement shows in a punk rock band. 
So I've got, that's a part of who I am. And I think under all of those experiences have put me in this position where um, I've said this before, and it sounds a little weird, but one of my natural skills that I think I've honed over the years is that I'm, it's very easy for me to be introduced to somebody and almost instantaneously file that person in a category, like a record store, almost like where you're like, okay, you're a punk rock band. So you belong in the rock section, but you don't belong next to, you know, the stones and ELO you're over here next to like rancid and, uh, Pennywise and all the good stuff. <laughs> yeah. And, but, but you're not, but you're not, you know, like East Bay hardcore. You're more of a, uh, like the early nineties pop punk with a little bit of emo mixed in. So you need to be over here by these bands. And so I think in a lot of ways, everybody wants to belong. Everybody wants to belong to their tribe. And so when you take a look at somebody or you meet somebody new, I don't find it problematic. I actually find it helpful from a business perspective and just from a normal like meeting people perspective and and learning how to relate to them be able to meet somebody and go okay well you're not like full redneck guy but you're also kind of like you you got you like work boots and you do like to hunt and fish but you also have a family and you know you you probably like like alternative country you're probably not like you know jason aldean radio country guy you're more like lucero guy and so you know and like (laughs) and and then you figure out like from a business perspective you figure out how that applies to what you're doing in your business right and so i've had to do that all of those experiences all meeting all those different people different cultures different races of people different um uh socioeconomic um, groups of people like you, you, you get to a position where in your business, you're like, okay, well, I'm making this product for this group of people. And then I'm going to make this product for this group of people. Right. And, um, I don't know if that answers your question. It's kind of long winded. No, no, it's great. Cause I think you, you touch on a few different things. Um, one, uh, I, you know, the pandemic has changed a lot. And I think we kind of got into this era of judging a book by its cover kind of thing, right? And I think what you're exploiting is like, you know what, even though you might listen to this type of music doesn't make you this type of person, you actually have a lot more underneath. You're, we're all onions, right? We have different layers, multiple layers of, of diversity underneath those layers. And I think you really did, you know, kind of highlight the fact that no one person is the same, right? Yeah. Uh, we, we all have different likes and different capabilities and, and different wants and needs, but that's also what makes us so beautiful, right? As, as individuals and it makes us you know, individually selfishly, it helps make me smarter by getting experience from other individuals, right. By, by introducing myself. Absolutely. And I mean, you know, in this, in the, in the, from in a world where we have a lot of division, obviously um, we're also more connected than we've ever been. We're safer than we've ever been. Um, it, a lot of people don't believe that, but it's absolutely true, just statistically, right? We live longer. As a whole, we're healthier. Um, all of those things. Um, and every, you're right, you do have to peel back those layers because you, it, it, from a business perspective, you're going to make a product for a certain person and a group of people. Well, that doesn't mean that Tim over here doesn't want that product. So how do you make it accessible to them, Right. In the world of the outdoors, specifically where we live, if we're talking about accessibility, it's stereotypically very whitewashed. And over the last probably three to five years, I've seen that change dramatically for the better. And I think that the internet and the scale at which the maturity of the internet has given people in people from walks of life that would typically not be involved in fishing specifically, let's say, has given them the opportunity to it's make it, it made it more accessible. And I think in some small way, our brand doing what we do with wild, crazy 
prints and stuff that, you know, ev everything we do is black and orange, you know, and, and you walk into a tackle shop or something and before everything sort of just looked like it was came out of the crocodile hunter's closet. And now, <laughs> now, you know, if you give people something that makes them feel like it's theirs, then they, then they feel more comfortable engaging in it. And I think that's great. You know, one of the things you just mentioned was like marketing and branding. And I, I got to admit, so folks, if you're listening, if you have not had an opportunity to check out Steelhead's uh, social media sites, I would highly recommend you do so. Because you, one, you have some great pictures. You have some really good pictures. But then you also have these like funny little comments to kind of get the get the kind of uh, audience engaged on the social media. How did you kind of start to brand and market yourself? You know, you're, you're, you're a fishing company. Where mm. do you market yourself? How do you brand? How do you How do you get the name out there? So as I said earlier, you know, we kind of came up right at Instagram hit scale. Um, and to be quite honest with you, we have really struggled to find our footing in the TikTok world. Um, there's a lot of people who uh, are into the outdoors on that platform, but it is we found it difficult to find growth there. Now, and I know our customers there. It's just they don't see what we do. Um, but it was a lot just organic um, social media content and really just thinking like, what do we want to see? You know, not like I'm never really worried about. I want Steelhead to feel accessible and real. I want people to feel like it's not run by like a, like a, some guy in a cubicle somewhere because it's not. And if we just do the same old corporate, like, product shots and the same old this and the same old that. And we never do any like funny memes. And Hey, sometimes we misstep and do something that offends people. We really, we do it. And honestly, I'm like, yeah, I'm human. The business is, is basically an entity and I make mistakes all the time. Sometimes I offend people, you know, um, we all, I think we all do to a certain extent. And so, but that's what makes it relatable. If you were whitewashed, Is it, would it be the same thing? My answer is no. And I don't think it would be as, as valuable to the customer if it was. And so I just always try to keep it real. You know, yeah. if I think something's funny, I'm going to say it, you know, yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah. And, and sometimes, sometimes we do stuff that, that doesn't resonate. Sometimes we think something's going to be great and it's not, but you know, really it's just about building it. Ultimately it's about building that community. Right. And, um, I think there's a lot of ways we can improve in that. I really do. I think there's a lot of ways we can improve in a lot of spaces, but that's one of them. And the problem that when we were just talking about this, the problem is, is like, it takes people and people take money and money is sort of hard to come by these days yeah. <laughs> in the last like six months, things have gotten a little bit more difficult. Yeah. So we, we would love to add to our staff to facilitate some of those things in growth, um, content creation, that type of stuff. We just got to figure out how we do it. What has outside of the pandemic, let's exclude the pandemic. What has been difficult recently for the business? Um, hiring people is really hard right now. Um, as you've heard everybody say, you know, this is a weird, this is a weird economy right now because you have half the talking heads saying it's great. Half the talking heads saying it's terrible, <laughs> depending upon who's in office. The other one says it's terrible. The one that's yeah. in office says it's great. And then um, you've got an economy that is sort of crawling out of record high inflation, yet also there's record low unemployment. And that doesn't really pencil, right? Right. You're like, well, everybody's working, everybody's making money, but they can't afford anything. And it's really weird. So that, that's been tough. And also you've got all these ripple effects because you, you, you can't, I know you say take the pandemic at it. That's impossible. You can't, you know, like right now, our biggest problem, if I'm being transparent as business owners is our wholesale component because we grew our wholesale by like 400% in 2021. And then in 2022, when the ripple effects of the pandemic and China closures happen, we are seeing this 
sort of unforeseen problem that, I mean, nobody could have seen this coming. All the big brands delivered all their products late. So outdoor stores are getting winter jackets in August. Well, that's why every store is running a 60% off blowout inventory sale during Christmas, but they're all their money's tied up in that stuff. And they don't have the money they would normally have to bring in our brand. So lots of our wholesale has sort of dried up. And basically what they're saying is, yeah, we'll, we'll visit you guys in spring when we move all this other, you know, Carhartt and Wrangler and sick of gear and everything else. And you're like, okay, what do we do now? <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it, it's, that's probably, the, that's easily the toughest thing we're facing right now. And then also from an inventory perspective on our side, because we prepared for all that wholesale and then it never Just came. Sitting. Oh yeah. Yeah. So if I'm, if I'm getting real with your listeners, that's, that's, that's the real stuff you face, yeah. you know? In fact, you know, let's get real with the listeners. What is some advice? You know, you've been doing this for some time now. You've grassrooted it. What is some advice, uh, you know, you would give to aspiring entrepreneurs, either pitfalls to watch out for or keep grinding on this area? What, what's some advice you have for the listeners? Hindsight's twenty twenty. Um, I 1000% would have, if I could go back in time, I would have mapped out these are all of the things that I want to do with this business. And I'm going to need these people to really do it well. And I'm going to need people in these positions, not specific people, but people in these positions to really do it well. And that's going to cost me X. So I need to borrow Y. Right. I didn't do that at all. And so now I'm in a situation where very much so on a daily basis, I'm in a war zone and I'm not able to stand on top of the tank and figure out who's shooting at me or where to go. I just have to load my gun every morning and shoot back at the people shooting at me, you know? And that's a weird spot to be in because you should, as a business owner, you should be able to stand on the tank and get a lay of the land. Right. And I'm not I'm not really in that position right now because of my own doing, because I didn't stop in the beginning and say, I'm going to need these positions filled in order to do this properly. So now I'm having to backtrack and it's it's it, I'm not alone in this. I know I'm not alone. This is everybody. So many entrepreneurs wear 4000 hats and you're going to have to. There's nobody who starts a business unless you're, you know, the king of angel investing and you get bazillions of dollars that doesn't wear 27 hats. But there does come a point where you're like, I can't plan ahead and grow this business unless I start to fill some of these roles because nobody's steering the ship. I'm working in my business instead of on it. And that's probably, that's probably the biggest thing really if, if, like your token piece of advice try your hardest to work on your business, not in it. Mm -hmm. um, I like I'm, that. Today, I'm still 10 years in, man. I'm still an employee. You know, I got a job, like a, like a show up at a certain time, do your job, task-oriented job I have to do on top of the top of running. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I think for me personally, uh, selfishly, that's resonating quite a bit. You know, I've been running this podcast for about, you know, coming up on two years now. And yeah. I'm kind of that point where I like, okay, if I want to keep this going, we're starting to get, you know, sponsor dollars. Uh, people are looking at the episode in that sense, but now I need somebody to kind of come in and do the things I'm not very good at. Right. Yep. Help me edit, help me run the website, you know, do the things that um, I'm getting to that point where I'm just going to have to outsource it because I, one, it's taken away the time that I know I should be focusing on other areas of the business where I can probably really make it take off. Right. Mm -hmm. And help the, help the production side of it but I'm spending too much time on the things I'm not really good at, but I have to yeah. do anyways, because I'm, if I don't do it, nobody else is doing it. It's me. It's a one man show. A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, dude, I'm going to hang up with you and take product shots of new hats. I'm yep. a terrible photographer. I have no <laughs> taking product shots of anything, um, but I don't have anybody currently who can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Makes you know, sense. and that stinks. I yeah. mean, it, 
it, it's it's a tough spot to be in. I mean, but do you just fold up shop? No, you do the best you can. Hell yeah, you roll up the sleeves, baby. Yep, yep. Do the best you can. Keep trucking. So Alex, it, an option. yeah, exactly. Exactly. So folks at home, if they're interested in learning more about Stillhead, in fact, you mentioned the grand opening of the Twalton location. Where is that location? How can they find you on the website and what are your social media channels? Yeah. So we're one eight six six zero Southwest Booms Ferry Road in Twalton. Um, we got a 2,400 square foot experience retail spot. I'm super proud of it. It's doing really well considering nobody knows we're here yet. I mean, it's only been open for two months. So um, come see us here. You can find us at stlhd.com. You can find us, just type in stlhd on Instagram or TikTok or Facebook. You'll find us there. We got um, our newsletter you can sign up for, get all the uh, news on what's going on. Um, follow us on TikTok, guys. I want to grow that TikTok, man. Let's do it. I like it. I mean, because there's a bunch of lame stuff on TikTok. I want to do something <laughs> cool. On yeah. You know, I feel like TikTok is like, there's some gems in there. There's some people who are doing really good content. I agree. And then it's just a sea of garbage. I, I agree. Know. I agree. I feel like uh, my, my, it's like, really good content mixed with like random dances and just like things like somebody's trying to get famous for doing their little, you know, this new stunt or whatever it might be. But I'm like, yeah, I'm like, there's so many, I'm still trying to get through that process as well. In fact, I posted one video the other day about the sweater we recently did. And I'm like, that's like the most TikTok I've got. I think I have like 500 views and that was the most, I I just can't seem to. Yeah. Not sure how to break through. (laughs) You know, it, it's it, TikTok is like it, it drives me up the wall because I know, I know our audience is there. Yeah, they just don't see what we do because we haven't done anything that that the TikTok algorithm has said. Oh, this is great, you know. Um, and then you have to do you have to figure out what that is and do it with consistency. Yeah. And you know, nobody wants to see me dance around half naked, so that's <laughs> not <gonna> work. <laughs> And you know, man, a whole nother. My OnlyFans sucks. I'm not making any money on my OnlyFans. <laughs> I'm the only fan. On I'm the only, only fan of my OnlyFans. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Man, uh, man, Alex, thank you again so much for being on the show. I really do appreciate it. And again, for those folks listening, we're going to have Alex and, and Still HD. They're going to be featured on the newsletter. So good shout out to sign up for the shadesofe.com newsletter. You can do that at the shadesofe.com. Also follow us on the social sites at the shades of E really do look forward uh, to hearing from some of your all stories. So those listening, please feel free to submit your time. If you want to be on the show on the shades of entrepreneurship, Alex, thank you again so much uh, for joining me. Is there any last words you want to give to the audience? Um, man, put me on the spot. <laughs> I think ultimately if you're thinking about start, starting a business, do it but don't steal time and money from your current employer because you will feel terrible down the line. Great advice. That is really good advice. Uh, And and more importantly, shop steelhead folks. It's in Tualatin. So those Oregon folks, please shed hit out the uh, store over there in Tualatin off of Boone's Ferry. And then you can also find them on the website, steelhead.com. I'm excited. Alex, thank you again yeah. so much. Uh, I, yeah, I personally you. love your stuff. I'm probably going to jump on and get myself a sweater because I've been doing that, meaning to do that. I missed the Black Friday event. I, I literally had it tagged because you had so many great things on Black Friday. I was like, oh, Clarence, yeah. everything. And that totally spaced it. Hey, also, real quick before you let me go, if somebody <laughs> checks out our stuff and they feel like, well, I'm not a huge fisherman and I can't, I can't wear this, or I'm not a steelhead fisherman I can't wear this, you can't. Not because I want to sell you a hoodie, but because you're welcome. You're welcome to join us. You're welcome to be a part of this family, so to speak. Hell yeah. And if you just picked up a fishing pole for the first time in your whole life, I said pole, I should have said rod. If you just picked up a fishing rod, you you can do it. You don't have to be intimidated by it. And you can and you can be a part of this too. Awesome. Alex, thank you again so much. For those listening, please follow me at The Shades of E, or you can visit at theshadesofe.com. Thank you, and have a great night. Thank you for tuning in to 
to The Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow The Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.